From the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you and yours are sheltering in place in a comfortable environment, and we look forward to joining you back in the grill room and in our yacht club just as soon as conditions permit. Our guest today arrived in America at age three, having taken a steamship with his folks from Bremen, Germany to New York City. It was the beginning of an auspicious career in oceanography. At age nine, he would remember rowing around in a lake near Scranton, Pennsylvania. And all through his teenage years, he would play in ski boats and swim and canoe and kayak. And at age nine, he learned to sail on a canvas kayak with a latine rig. If you can make one of those go fast, you are a good man. And you certainly have uh, the tenacity that you'll need to do some of the incredible missions that our speaker is up to today. He would go on to Cooper Union get a degree in oceanography, and he would participate on the Cooper Union sailing team. Now, that sailing team is also a competitor of Princeton and Rutgers and Kings Point, and he's two years older than Gary Jobson, which means that he likely, like many of us in the world, has been beaten on the water in a sailboat race by Gary Jobson, another and frequent was the yachting luncheon guest. Our speaker spent a junior year at the Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institute, which completely set the hook on oceanography for him. Go on to earn a PhD at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography in Oceanography. He's here to talk today about not your grandmother's sea level rise. As we all know, there's much debate about whether there is or isn't sea level rise whether the earth is or isn't warming, I thought we'd have as a speaker today someone who could provide ample evidence of sea level rise. That is to say, we expect hard metrics which demonstrate a record of changing earth temperature and sea level rise. So with that, welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, Reinhard Flick. Thanks uh, very much, Ron, for the introduction and honor to be here with the St. Francis Yacht Club. Like you mentioned, Gary Jobson, didn't know it at the time, but would turn into one of my heroes. Uh, I have his books. Uh, I use his books. Uh, I almost certainly got beaten multiple times in my junior and senior year. And I I would only disagree with you that uh, this whole climate change thing is controversial. Uh, (laughs) There's really not much controversy. There's not much room for controversy. There is a lot of uncertainty. I would say, and I will talk about that a little bit, you know, the areas of uncertainty. I have to ask a question also. Your picture behind you, yeah, that is, that's the Brigantine Californian? That's from- the Brigantine Californian. It's the official tall ship of the state of California, uh, as designated uh, by Arnold, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, of all people. Back in the 80s or 90s, I can't remember the date, uh, it was built in time for the LA Olympics, uh, right down there in San Diego. And had a lot of trouble launching it because when they tried to launch it, it sunk into the sand. So they had quite a time getting it off the ground. <laughs> but it's a replica revenue cutter. And when the wind picks up and all the sails are up and the topsails are up, uh, and it basically feels like it's coming out of the water and scooting along. It's over 100 feet long, about uh, more or less. And I crewed on it for a time, and it, 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 it's just a joy to be on. Uh, it out regularly. You have the Maritime Great. Museum in San Diego. Go for it. So, Reinhard, you also go by the name of Ron. If I got that right? Yes, sir. That's right. It simplifies things if you're not German. <laughs> Great. Thanks very much again uh, for making this opportunity for me to talk with the likes of Jobson and, and others. And uh, Larry Goldsbund, for example, who gave a really good overview, a great overview of the mitigation adaptation measures that are going on in San Francisco Bay. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, as I go along. There's a picture of my grandmother uh, and me when I was about age five. And uh, her, her role in, in this talk will become clear as we go along. So what can we do in an hour? Well, we can talk about what the problem is. Uh, we can talk about the evidence that Earth uh, is warming. Uh, we'll talk about what sea level is on various time scales, including geological time scales back about 800,000 years, uh, all the way up to the present and then into the future, what the projections are that should be considered. 
So we can talk about mean sea level, uh, MSL. We'll talk about the future of mean sea level rise. That is how sea level projections are made and what they mean and how high sea level might get, uh, for example, in the next 80 years and in the next few hundred. Then we can say a little bit about how flooding actually manifests, right? Because mean sea level is not what actually floods you. It's the high tide and big storms and that sort of thing. And uh, we'll do that from measurements. So we'll show some measurements from San Francisco specifically. And uh, what can be done in terms of how to cope with uh, sea level rise, in particular climate change in general in the future. So uh, I, I, not to pick on the St. Francis Yacht Club, uh, but you are on a spit of land in the north end of the city of San Francisco. I have a circle around the location from this Google Earth photo. And uh, I'm gonna talk about the San Francisco SFO tide gauge, which is located at Fort Point, just on the other end, on the west end of Chrissy Field from where the Yacht Club is located. So there's a couple of things I've pulled off your website, a couple of pictures taken by, I assume, some of your members. And besides the striking view of the Golden Gate uh, and this part of San Francisco Bay in general, I see two things uh, or three things that are interesting right away with the location of the Yacht Club. First of all, there's a lot of armor rock uh, in front of your location, which suggests that uh, in the past or in anticipation of future erosion, somebody spent a lot of money and effort piling a lot of rocks up in front of your club. Exactly. After the Loma Prieta earthquake in 89, we rebuilt quite a bit of the club, about half the club, and we had that giant riprap stuck and planted right in front of our yacht club because many of us at that point were recognizing that literally waves were breaking onto the windows at the north face of the yacht club, the grill room and the foyer, etc. That's why those rocks got put there. Yeah, well, that's an interesting bit of history and I think might be something to foretell what the future might hold. The other thing that strikes me in the lower right-hand picture is that your gangway, and this looks like it's close to high tide, but not, the picture was taken close to high tide, but not quite at high tide, looking at the location of the water marks there on the pilings. Uh, first of all, it looks like you've only got five or six feet maybe of piling clearance on your float dock here. And also the, the gangway here is already horizontal near high tide. So with two or three or four or six feet of sea level, you're going to be going uphill, right, to go from land to the dock. So these are the things that strike me uh, right off. So again, the San Francisco tide gauge is located on a pier uh, just inside of the Golden Gate, and that'll become an important part of uh, what we talk about. In San Francisco Yacht Club in Belvedere, where I've kept a boat off and on since 1961, it is just like you said, for the first time ever lately, the gangway off of the floats onto land mm -hmm. sometimes is level. And that causes all of us long timers to look at each other and say, look, it, this never happened before. It was never that we walked straight off the dock, off the floats onto level docks. That's the gangways never were level like this. So I'm giving you other antidotal evidence of the point you're broadly making. Yeah, I've, I've done some consulting work in Richardson Bay and in, in Belvedere in, in particular, and in the north end of, of Richardson Bay, there's quite a flooding problem uh, already and has been for quite some time when the wind blows out of the south. So I'm not surprised because you've got that entire uh, day long fetch, right? To push water up there and it gets on the road and makes a, makes nuisance flooding. I've got this slide here. Um, there's a website that's relatively new that I'm, I hadn't been familiar with uh, until I ran into it preparing this talk. And I was looking for nuisance flooding pictures like the one in the lower right. So this is from January, 2019 from the Embarcadero. And because of heavy rainfall, this is not ocean flooding, bay flooding, this is heavy rainfall, but sea level rise has quite a bit to do with drainage because as sea level goes up during high tides, the drains in the street become less efficient. And so uh, large rainfall events like this can be slow to drain. And that's an indirect effect. Now, it seems like you and, and many millions of other uh, properties have come to the attention of a company called floodfactor.com. I didn't know anything about this until I stumbled across the website, but I thought I'd include it. There you are. 
uh, yacht road, there's the yacht club with a nice little red dot on it, along with all these others in the, in the coastal part of the marina district. And I'll talk a little bit about this more about the ends with some actual elevations. You may want to look into this. I have some sources in the, in the coastal flooding community, and they tell me that this is legitimate. This is, this is not a gag. I would point out this uh, article from August 1912, an article in a newspaper from New Zealand, and they talk about coal consumption affecting climate. This is over 100 years ago. And let's read this. The furnaces of the world are now burning about two gigatons, two billion tons of coal per year. When this is burned, uniting with oxygen, it adds about seven gigatons carbon dioxide to the atmosphere yearly. This tends to make the air a more effective blanket for the earth and to raise its temperature. The key point here is that the effect may be considerable in a few centuries which hit the nail on the head, because by 2021, we will see major changes that I'll, I'll outline. I do want to mention here that uh, the, f the first uh, physics uh, was done by a physicist named John Tyndall, an Irishman uh, who worked in Great Britain, uh, in 1863 published a paper uh, where he had looked at a number of, a large number of gases uh, and their radiative effects. In other words, their effect when you sh shined light on them and how they absorbed or did not absorb energy. And so he was the first one really to do a scientific study of the effect of carbon dioxide on atmospheric radiation and the fact that it could warm the earth by acting like a blanket. So he was the first one to put the physics behind the greenhouse effect that we'll talk about in a second. There was a, a second gentleman here as a Swede uh, in 1896, he worked on the effect of CO2 on the temperature, and specifically in the Arctic. Uh, and he made a calculation that doubling or tripling CO2, which at the time was about oh, a little, little under 300 parts per million in the atmosphere, would raise the temperature of the Earth by about 8 degrees centigrade. And that's very close to the six or so that we think uh, you know, current physics uh, and, and, and measurements tell us is, is about correct. That's amazing. That is amazing. So, yeah, this uh, Svante Arrhenius was actually a Nobel laureate. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize in, uh, in chemistry. I don't know if it was for this work or for some other work. His grandson uh, was a professor. He died uh, recently. His grandson, Gustav uh, Gus Arrhenius, was a chemistry Professor at Scripps, uh, I knew him well. Uh, he was he was a good friend, a very good guy. He was one of the first ones to work on the chemistry, the, the grandson that is, the chemistry of moon rocks. Uh, he was a cosmochemist. That's an aside. So we'll, uh, we'll we'll move along here and talk about the greenhouse effect. And I want to be sure, I want to be clear that the greenhouse effect is a good thing because without it, the Earth's temperature would be about zero degrees Fahrenheit. It'd be an ice ball essentially. With the greenhouse effect which uh, is basically the greenhouse gases like CO2 and many other gases, trap some of the radiative heat, some of the sunlight from the sun and trap it and make the earth about 60 degrees on average warmer. Of course, some places on the earth are hotter, some are colder, obviously, but the earth on average is about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 60 degrees warmer than it would be without the atmosphere. So another way to look at this is uh, the, th the three closest planets here. So the Earth and its two neighbors. Mars has a very thin atmosphere. Mars has been in the news lately, right? Because uh, we're actually going to try to live there someday. Uh, it's about minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit because almost all the CO2 greenhouse gases are in the ground. On the other hand, Venus has a very thick atmosphere. It's about 96% CO2. And the average temperature is about 790 degrees uh, in, in the shade, I'm told, because of the increase in CO2 that we'll talk about next. There is now a radiation imbalance of about one watt per square meter. So there's more radiation coming in than is going out at the moment. And uh, this watts per square meter unit will become important as we talk about future possibilities of radiative imbalance because it comes up in these discussions of the warming Earth. How do we know that uh, CO2 is increasing, greenhouse gases in general, CO2 in particular, is increasing? Well, uh, there's this thing called the Keeling curve that started the upper part of this, labeled SIO for Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And 
Uh, there was uh, a guy named Dave Keeling, a professor at Scripps, uh, succeeded now by his son, Ralph Keeling, who's also a professor at Scripps. Uh, Dave died about 20 years ago or so. Uh, he started measuring atmospheric concentration of CO2 very accurately in the late 1950s, about 1957 or so. So we have an instrumental record of CO2 increasing at the time. It was about uh, 320 or so parts per million. And uh, as of this week, uh, we are up to about 419 parts per million. How did we measure parts per million in 1750? <laughs> we didn't measure it in 1750. The line here before the 50s uh, is done from ice cores that actually go back about 800,000 years. So Antarctic ice cores and other ice cores in glaciers where air is trapped and then buried under many, many, many meters, and in some cases, two miles thick of ice sheet in Antarctica, that preserves the air that was in the atmosphere, at least around the time the ice froze. And that's a fairly good uh, indicator. When those cores are melted in a vacuum, we can measure gas concentrations and also the temperature from the oxygen and carbon isotope ratios. I want to point out this 295, about 300 parts per million or so when those measurements uh, began. And the so-called pre-industrial levels of carbon dioxide are about 270 parts per million. Now, people talk about, well, we should do something and maybe the Western world, the United States in particular, and the European world should do more than the developing world. And that's based on not so much matters of justice because it's the cumulative amount of CO2 in the atmosphere that is leading to the warming and will continue. More than half of that was contributed by the U.S. and by the European Union, so the Western world, as opposed to some of the other entities, Russia, China, Japan, India, for example. This cumulative measure is of all of time in the Industrial Revolution up till now, or is this currently what's no. going on? No, no, no. This is, this is total cumulative from, you know, from day one of the Industrial Revolution. Right. Okay. Right. So in other words, it's not current contribution to... No, no. The current contribution is quite different. China actually contributes about twice as much as the U.S. currently. Got it. But that's not what's causing the warming. The current emissions aren't what's causing the warming. It's going to, it's going to continue the accumulation of CO2. But historically, the Western world, uh, because of its earlier uh, industrial development, uh, you know, that started in Great Britain and quickly spread to the U.S., uh, after the Civil War, uh, especially and after World War II, as we'll see in a minute. And the, the, the point of this slide is uh, two or three things. Uh, first of all, CO2, temperature, and sea level. So you have those three things there, the CO2 concentration in green, the global temperature in red, and the sea level, uh, reconstructed sea level over the past 400,000 years, which is essentially four glacial cycles in the past. These move together. And so there's, you know, there's discussion about, well, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Did CO2 come first, the temperature come first? Uh, it really doesn't matter. Sometimes CO2 goes up first, temperature follows, and sea level follows. Or the temperature goes up and leads, and then that leads to bigger CO2 concentrations that then through feedback mechanisms make both grow uh, and sea level. Uh, so the, the sea level comings and goings is, of course, related mostly to the ice coming and going. So the glacial ice caps in the northern and southern hemisphere growing and waning. Right. This is a fascinating chart. The blue shows sea level oh, from yes. zero down to minus 400 feet. Is that what it shows? Correct. Yeah, compared to the present sea level. And it shows a correlation of from minus seven to plus four and a half, or in other words, 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Is this Fahrenheit? This is Fahrenheit. Yeah, about 14 degrees Fahrenheit. 14 degrees swing in Fahrenheit right. and 280 parts per million swing in CO2 concentration. And your point is, whether or not we know which is causal, whether the temperature causes the CO2 concentration or vice versa, what we know is that there is a long historic record going back, this is 400,000 years, uh, that shows there's an absolute correlation between these three. They move together. It goes back millions of years, actually. So you're saying without any question, if the global temperature changes and or if the CO2 level changes, the sea level will change also. Yes. 
so CO2 and, and temperature are, re, are closely related. And then that leads to melting of ice, freezing of water that then re results in large changes in sea level. There's a, a bit of expansion involved as well. You know, as the water gets warmer, as the oceans get warmer, they expand uh, without adding mass. But the big contributors here are ice sheets coming and going. Okay, and so as you've circled at the upper right-hand corner of your chart, you show lately a typically high CO2 concentrations. However, the question is what caused the rise in CO2, you know, every 100,000 years until now? Well, so these are obviously natural, right? Because you know, there were no human influence, right? at least that we know of, uh, in, the, in the last few million years on this right. scale. So the, the pacing of this 100,000 year, and you'll see some 20,000 year and some 40,000 year fluctuations in here. The pacing of this has to do with very small changes in sunlight, in insulation, right? In other words, the amount of sunlight is reaching especially the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, and these are related to changes in the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit around the sun, right? The spin axis of the Earth and also the wobble of that spin axis as the Earth rotates around the sun and as the Earth rotates around its axis. So those are 100,000, more or less 100,000 year, 20,000 year, and 40,000 year, more or less, uh, fluctuations that then lead to feedback. So in other words, if a little bit of less sunlight reaches the Arctic going through the cold phase, uh, there's a little bit more ice in the wintertime a little bit less melting in the summertime. And there's a little bit more white, a little bit less blue, and a little bit less green and brown, right? Earth and, and water. And so that leads to positive feedback to cooling. And then that sets into these cooling phases. What, what causes the CO2 concentration to go up? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, it, comes, it comes out of the ocean during warm phases and other greenhouse gases, not just CO2, but methane. As the Earth gets uh, on these timescales of tens and hundreds of thousands of years, it causes more erosion, which e increases or decreases CO2 because it literally comes out of the rocks. But that's what changes the CO2 concentration. And you look here, and over the past few million years, CO2 has never gone up much above 280 parts per million. So during the Eemian, this is the last 100,000 years ago, the last 100,000 year peak, uh, CO2 concentration was 300 something parts per million, much less than the 419, but 300 so parts per million. The sea level rise related to that was 25 feet due to a 1.8 degree increase in temperature. So if you do the arithmetic there, that's about 14 feet of sea level rise per degree Fahrenheit. So remember that number. Warming phases tend to happen very rapidly because of these feedbacks. So as CO2 and greenhouse gases increase, and water vapor is one of them. Methane is another one. As these things increase, the temperature goes up very quickly, as does the sea level. The cooling phases take much, much longer. So you see the cooling from high CO2 to low CO2, high temperature to low temperature, happen over much, much longer periods of time. And this, this is not good for the future. So <laughs> you'll see here, like you pointed out, that we are at an unprecedented, over the last few million, millions of years, level of, of CO2 concentration and greenhouse gas concentration uh, in the atmosphere. So I want to move along. Uh, I want to move along here. Just keep these things in mind. 25 feet of sea level rise for 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. So what is the global temperature right now? Well, it's about two degrees Fahrenheit already warmer than it was in pre-industrial times, which is more or less out here 1880 and before uh, it's within, this is within a tenth of a degree. This is new science that was published recently by Jim Hansen and some of his colleagues. Uh, this is a NASA data reconstruction of uh, temperature or temperature measurements that are uh, plotted here. You can see the effects of El Nino, right, that warms the Earth, and the La Nina effects over the last couple of years that actually cool the whole Earth. So there are small uh, fluctuations, but it's pretty clear that most of this increase has happened since World War II. You see, so before the 40s, right after World War II, when the vast industrialization and huge increases in wealth and burning of fossil fuels um, really took off after World War II. If you go back to the one slide here, 
14 feet per degree Fahrenheit, no matter what we do with greenhouse gases in the future, two degrees Fahrenheit warming is already baked in. So, you know, we could already be in for the equivalent ice melt of 28 feet of sea level rise, just al already without, you know, without doing anything else, even if we stopped all greenhouse gas emissions tomorrow. Uh, the current interglacial lasted uh, since about 20,000 years ago or so. So this uh, 20,000 years ago, there was a mile of ice over New York City and over much of North America and Scandinavia. Uh, and that retreated uh, in fits and starts. So it didn't go smoothly. There were these things called melt pulses, uh, for example, where sea level went up uh, you know, 40 feet uh, in a few centuries. Nobody's saying that this will happen in the future. But if you look at this past, <laughs> Uh, 400 feet of sea level rise over the last 20 years associated with about a nine degree Fahrenheit rise in temperature. If you do that arithmetic, that gives you 44 feet per degree Fahrenheit, uh, even bigger than the 14 feet uh, that we saw in the Eemian. Now, the other thing that's really interesting about this is that sea level rise stopped almost dead still about 6,000 years ago. And we have evidence uh, from a Roman ports uh, in Israel, of all places, where the holes where the bollards were, uh, the place called Caesarea around Christian times, the tops of those docks are only a few inches below mean sea level. So, you know, mean sea level hasn't gone up very much, uh, certainly over the last 2,000 years and, and likely over the last six. The point here is that civilization, coastal human civilization, is about that same age, five or 6,000 years old. So what's coming in the future has never been experienced by humans in the past. We have never seen temperatures and sea level rise we are in for in the next couple of hundred years uh, in, in human history, in human civilization history. Now, uh, how do we know sea levels going up? Well, we have some measurements. Uh, they started as early as 1700 in Amsterdam. Uh, Brest is in France, Baltic Sea. It's pretty clear. That since 1700 all the way into the 1800s, there wasn't really much sea level rise. There were a bunch of fluctuations, you know, due to wind and pressure and other things going on, El Ninos and whatnot. And the sea level rise didn't really start to kick in until 1850 or so. You can see that at San Francisco, you can see it at Brest, you can see it in Sunamunde, and you can certainly see it in reconstructions. So this is the San Francisco tide gauge. Uh, sea level has gone up since uh, 1850. They're about eight tenths of a foot. That's this from two and a half to about 3.3 feet. And this is an NAVD, right? So this is a geodetic uh, datum that you can relate to the elevation of your sidewalk uh, right outside in front of your yacht club. Uh, there are some really interesting fluctuations and even uh, relative still stands of sea level for 20 or 30 years where sea level didn't go up on the West Coast. So, you know, when you, when you want to look at sea level rise, I look at the minima. That's what these lines are for. The minima are not affected so much by these El Ninos, which give you higher sea levels uh, for a few years at a time. So you're saying that 83 spike is, in fact, El Nino. That That's an El Nino. It's undoubtedly an El Nino, as 2016 was, uh, 15, 16, 97, 98, 1941. The warming is about 1.2 degrees Celsius, 2.2 degrees Fahrenheit from pre-industrial times till recently now. And the mean sea level has gone up about a quarter of a meter, eight tenths of a foot. The question is, what future do we want? Now, Greta Thunberg, somebody I met a couple of weeks ago, described as a mentally ill Swedish teenager. Well, she has Asperger's. That's not quite the same thing as mental illness. Uh, <laughs> she tells it how it is. Now, I don't want you to panic. Uh, at least not yet. There'll be, there'll be time for panic. I want to use a different P word, and that's plan. I want to encourage everybody to plan. Let me put this uh, CO2 into context and the industrial output of CO2. So remember in 1912, in that newspaper article, they mentioned seven gigatons. So here we are now in 2020, we emitted 43 gigatons of CO2. This is the per year increase in CO2 emissions. Okay. That's right. So here we are now, 2020. So we, we have a choice. You know, we, we can choose a high emissions, basically business as usual scenario where, where we will end up with four to five degree change, centigrade change, you know, 10, 12 degrees Fahrenheit increase in temperature, or we can eventually somehow move to low emissions, 
And here's where these uh, 8.5 watts per square meter that I mentioned earlier come in. So a low emission scenario would get us to 2.6 watts per square meter in balance from the current one watt per square meter by 2100, or the high emissions gets us to eight and a half watts per square meter. Watts is in this case a measure of, of temperature of rate of energy, energy, of energy of radiative energy. And you're saying we hold some of it, 2.6 watts per square meter at the bottom. Well, in the future, we're holding about one right now, but that's going to grow. So RCP, what's RCP again? So the RCPs are so-called radiative concentration pathways. These come from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, so-called IPCC, that I haven't mentioned yet. I want to move on here to, what do we know? Well, the basic science, and I want to, I want to say the basic science, not all the science was settled a long time ago, and I'm not trying to imply that any of this sea level science is simple, but warming is happening now. We're seeing the consequences of it all over the place. Uh, it's caused largely by human greenhouse gas contributions, especially CO2 to the atmosphere from fossil fuel burning. What can we do? Well, at least three things other than give up and do nothing, which in many respects will be the most costly uh, approach. So Jim Hansen, the leading authority in climate Research almost 35 years ago warned us of what was coming. And he is an advocate of something called the carbon fee uh, that makes us pay the actual cost of burning fossil fuels. And that's gaining some bipartisan traction. Winston Churchill, in his 1941 speech, exemplified well fighting, in other words, building things, never surrender, uh, stay put, and uh, build things like dikes uh, to uh, make it possible to live with sea level rise for much longer than we otherwise would if we retreated. He's saying adapt. The first guys mitigate, second guys adapt. Okay. Right. Second guys adapt. So Churchill is the adaptation uh, uh, poster child here. And uh, run away and retreat is kind of the Woody Allen approach, who's always had an inordinate fear of sea level. That's from his comedy act <laughs> in the 1960s. <laughs> uh, I want to get to the guidance. I want to summarize the guidance from the California Coastal Commission, CCC, and the OPC uh, that do an update every five years or so, and one is coming in 2022. Who's OPC? OPC is the Ocean Protection Council. So that's the scientific arm uh, of the state of California. And uh, I put guidance in quotes because uh, if you want to do anything, certainly development on the coast, then uh, this is more than guidance. These are the future sea level rise scenarios, at least currently, that are in force in the state of California that you have to pay attention to and that you have to address. And that goes for all state agencies and public agencies, as well as any private individuals that think they're gonna build something on the coast. So the summary here is that six to 10 feet are possible of sea level rise are possible this century, albeit un unlikely. But last year, the OPC is starting to encourage three and a half feet. Consider three and a half feet by 2050. So the high emissions and the low emissions, there we are again, right? The 2.6 RCP and the 8.5 RCP. There are two separate sets of sea level projections out to 2150 relative to 2000 if we go to low emissions and high emissions. And they have probabilities associated with them. If Greenland and Antarctica ice collapses, then we're on this H++. Highly unlikely, much less than 1 in 200 or 1 in 20 or 50-50. So here's the 50-50. Sea level rise is currently thinking half likely to go higher, half likely to be lower than these 50-50 scenarios. And I want to just point this out. The 50-50 is two and a half feet by 2100. It's pretty modest. So help us understand what you say at the top. If Greenland melts, we that adds 20 feet of sea yeah, level? Yeah, if Greenland, if all the Greenland melts, in other words, all the ice on Greenland melts, it adds 20 feet to global sea level. If all of Antarctica melts, it adds 200 feet of sea level. Nobody's anticipating that uh, at, at this point. Nobody thinks all of Antarctica is going to melt. West Antarctica might melt. So this is a blow up of this previous slide. 50-50 low scenario out to 2150, but it includes the data from San Francisco. So this is the measurement from San Francisco from 1855 to 2020. And here's a blow up of that from inside the arrow, right? From 1970 to 2050. 
that's this. So this shows a couple of things. It shows this high scenario, even the 50-50 high, right? 50-50, two and a half feet by 2100. By, by 2150, this is gonna be way higher than anything that's been measured on the West Coast. Even this relatively low 50-50 chance of exceedance or being below it. None of this is gonna, uh, we won't be able to differentiate which path we're on because of the fluctuations in sea level, right? So these are the El Ninos, there's 83, 2016. The natural fluctuations in sea level in the Pacific Ocean kind of mask which trend we're on. So are we on this H++ trend? Are we on one of these other ones? Or the ones in between that I'm not showing here? That's the question. So here's how my grandmother comes in. And, uh, and I sent this slide to Jim Hansen and he actually, since I use his stuff all the time, he, uh, he liked this so much, he's actually using it in some of his talks. <laughs> so my grandmother, Louisa, was born in 1898 and she lived until 1984. And if you look at sea level starting, starting in 1850 as zero, right? So sea level by the time she was born was sort of up to her little baby ankles over here, right? If she was 18 inches tall when she was born. By the time she died in 1984, sea level had gone up to the lower part of her shins, right? She was about five, six or so. Now, my granddaughter, on the other hand, was born in 2017, right? She's four years old now. Uh, by that time, sea level, global sea level had already gone up to her baby waist. Now, by the time if she lives, uh, you know, the women on both sides of our family, you know, live a pretty long time. She has a very good probability of living to age 90 or so. Right, that's 2107. So she will touch the next century in lifespan, but sea level will almost certainly be uh, up to her waist, or you know, up to her fanny, or up to her waist, or it'll be way over her head. Right, there's a possibility that it'll be way over her head, depending on which trajectory you go on, and how fast and how much of Antarctica and Greenland actually melt over the next hundred years or so. So I found the benchmark that's 13 feet NAVD, right? North American vertical data. It's what all the engineers and architects use when they talk about land elevations. So the marina district uh, in general is, is less than 20 feet. The important point of this is that um, even if the yacht club is not gonna be affected by sea level flooding, you still have the wave problem, right? The waves are gonna come in and increasingly break over your revetment you mentioned that earlier. And you certainly need to look at a plan for your next 100 years, right? The Yacht Club's at this location is almost 100 years old. I can tell you for sure that I found another benchmark out here at Chrissy Field. That's closer to 10 feet. And yeah. They're already having nuisance flooding. So my point here is that even if the Yacht Club uh, is relatively safe for some number of decades, access is going to be a problem. It's yeah. going to be hard to get there because the roads are going to be flooded. Okay. During high tides and during big rainfall events. So, incredibly scaring us. Well, uh, I, I don't want to scare you. I don't want to panic you. I don't want to use that word. I want you to think about planning. So, the bottom line here, as far as planning for sea level rise, is that there are going to be losses. And my, my take on this is that there will be losses over the next century. And those losses will be significant, but there will also be gainers, there will be winners. Uh, their winners will be engineers, they'll be scientists, they'll be builders. But the losers are, one of the losers are going to be the community of near coastal property owners. Many of these coastal, and, and that's going to be in places like New Orleans, in places like Venice is already coming into play. The West Coast is in much better situation than much of the rest of the world, including the Gulf Coast of the U.S., Florida, places like Venice that have subsidence problems in addition to the sea level rise. Uh, so, you know, San Francisco, a lot of which is on very high ground, uh, and, and San Diego, a lot of which is on very high ground, just because of the tectonic history that I could spend another hour talking about, uh, just because of our geological setting, the West Coast is on much better shape than many other places in the world. However, there still are, are gonna be problems. There are still gonna be losers. Um, coastal property being one of them that eventually with 10 or 15 or 20 feet of, of sea level, it will not be possible to keep the St. Francis Yacht Club or any other yacht club in the present location. But I want you to start thinking about who's going to take the haircut. How are those losses going to be distributed? 
when they come. Now we don't know when they'll come. That's the problem. If we, if I could tell you, then you know I would be much richer than I am. Uh, I can't tell you, but it because it all depends on how the ice reacts and how it melts, how fast it melts, and how much of it ultimately melts. And a lot of that depends on what humans do, and in turn how much it warms and how fast the ice reacts. That is scientifically uncertain right now. We know the basic physics, we just don't know this, the speed. Okay. So planning, that's what we want. That's what I'm looking for here, planning. I just want to leave this for people to look at. You know, what are we going to do? So, you know, assuming that the, uh, that the goal is to uh, decrease or eliminate greenhouse gases, we, you know, there's social and political, technological and economic and legal things uh, that have to be done to accomplish that. You're saying in three big categories, this is the social uh, what to do is this is the technological what to do is this is the legal and economic potential what to do at least some of them yeah yeah you know, ironically voting doesn't always work so I've got a question on that very subject for you so it seemed to me for some time and before the 2016 election I wrote about this it seems to me that Russia benefits from global sea level rise and global warming because Moscow is 350 feet above sea level and 800 miles from the shoreline. And uh, their northern Urals uh, would be ideal farmlands if they could just warm them up. And the mineral deposits in all their territory would be more exploitable if they could warm them up. And the northern shoreline would have very short deep water sea lanes to the rest of the world. So you could be sailing around the world just goes straight down from Russia to anywhere. And, and, and that would explain why they are doing a lot in terms of defense of their northern borders and northern shorelines. They're making icebreakers. They have more icebreakers than everybody else put together. So I, I, I worry that they actually aren't saying anything about it, but that they're wanting sea level rise and global warming. I agree. My my father was uh, my my father fought the Russians in uh, in Finland uh, during World War II, and uh, was one of the reasons we emigrated. You mentioned you know why we left Germany. Well, my mother was half Jewish, and my father fought in the army and was heavily injured. He wanted to move someplace the Russians couldn't walk. Uh -huh. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, oh, I I think you're 100 percent correct. Uh, I think the uh, the Chinese uh, currently in the current geopolitical situation. And in the greenhouse gas uh, context, are I think though uh, all, everything you say is true. I think it would be of much more benefit than probably than loss, as far as I know, to Russia. But I think China is the key. And if U.S. and, and China can get together on this greenhouse gas emissions, we could solve. You know, we we could start to solve the problem. Uh, in other words, you know, put a, a, a carbon fee, uh, make carbon use, uh, carbon fossil fuel use. Um, cost what you know what it actually costs. okay great if China would agree to that I think we could solve it with or without Russia India or anybody else they would have to come along just because there would be uh, tax on imports if they didn't have their own tax so this is it uh, to summarize you know Antarctica is warming but it still keeps the beer mighty cold take my word for it um, you got about you, you got about a minute once you pop the Heineken open. And you let the pressure out uh, before it turns to slush at 20 degrees, which is what we're doing here on the, this is a, uh, this was an expedition to the Ross ice shelf, uh, which is an important part of West Antarctica and keeps the West Antarctic ice sheet from sliding into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we were there on a quest to uh, install seismometers. And uh, this is some of the other scientists, this guy in the orange is an engineer. And we were taking a break. Um, we were camped uh, at a place called Yesterday Camp because it was very near the date line, near the 180 degrees date line. You could walk a couple hundred yards and be in yesterday. Well, so let me see if I got this right. Are you saying something would happen to our beer? I mean, I'm talking about real urgent mission, real question here. <laughs> well, see, the, the point is that the Arctic and the Antarctic are still mighty cold, which explains these, I, these outbreaks of cold you know, in the Midwest that we get when the jet stream comes down. This was all predicted. It's all in the models. It's all in the, uh, uh, in, you know, Hansen's and other models. And it's been known for 30 or 40 years that you could have increased cold spells in the Midwest 
all related to global warming. So you have to keep these concepts separate. The earth is warming and that causes climate change, which includes cooling of some places sometime. You see, it doesn't mean that, oh, you know, Duluth is colder this, or Ohio is colder this week uh, because of some cold air outbreak, you know, from the Arctic that's still mighty cold. And that means global warming is not happening. See, that's, that was one of the arguments. Uh, okay, so I have another question and or point. It seems uh, to me from, you know, my amateur perspective that it's just way less expensive to prevent global warming than to um, to try to accommodate global warming. I mean, the whole notion that we have to start building, you know, dikes all around the world to uh, make sure that Florida isn't underwater or Miami isn't underwater or New Orleans, Washington, D.C., New York City, you know, Boston are not underwater. That just seems like an untenable idea. On the right. other hand, when we start looking at the cost of doing it, we might more quickly recognize that axiom that I just spun out, which is it's cheaper to prevent global warming than to try to you know, accommodate it afterwards. That would be true, except for what I showed. See, there's, there's, already, there's already tens of feet of sea level rise baked in, no matter what we do, it's unavoidable. The, the point here is that it takes so long because of the inertia, the thermal inertia of the ice caps, especially Antarctica, um, and to, and to a large extent, Greenland, those are gonna keep melting for hundreds of years, no matter what we do. And there's no stopping that. It's technologically impossible. Even if we stop emitting greenhouse gases tomorrow, the temperature will continue to increase. And the ice is so far behind in equilibrium of the two degrees Fahrenheit that we've already warmed, never mind the five degrees we might warm, that sea level rise on an unprecedented scale of tens of feet. And the question is how fast? It doesn't look like we changed it that much in the last hundred years. It looks like what's coming is scary. So, but you're saying, yes, no, absolutely. it's already changed so much that um, the thermal inertia, I liked your term, the thermal inertia is so significant that no matter what we do right now, we have to plan for higher sea level. Yes. Like, it's unavoidable. Okay. It's unavoidable. Now, we, we don't know how much. It could be tens, tens of feet, you know, from what I showed from the paleo record, it could be more. And, and we don't know how fast. And that makes a difference. If, if the sea level goes up 10 feet in the next 90 years or 80 years, that's a big deal. That's very hard to deal with and a very expensive problem. If it goes up 10 feet or 20 feet in 500 years, that's probably much more manageable. Okay, so so what's so the scenario is we have to work on what's manageable. In other words, effectively, I think you're saying we have to take serious action as fast as possible, yeah. and uh, otherwise we're going to be paying so much money trying to accommodate for sea level rise. Well, we're going to pay a lot of money to accommodate for sea level rise. And like I said, there will be winners, there will be losers um, for sea level rise. What we want to avoid, and this is why we want to get onto the greenhouse gas emissions problem, is the very worst of these consequences, including the heating and the long-term melt. If, if we lose all of Greenland and, and most of Antarctica, you're talking about you know, up to 80, 60, 80 feet of global sea level rise over the next three, four, 500 years, or maybe longer, but that's still a big problem. Now, the other thing I would say to, to address your point is that, uh, and this is my personal view, I'm not an economist, I haven't studied this. It seems to me there is so much wealth to be created by addressing climate change that it will make the industrial revolution look like baby's play. And the industrial revolution was, a, was they called it a revolution for a reason. It, it increased wealth, it increased standard of living to an unprecedented, you and I are alive, you know, I'm 73 now, you're, I don't know how old you are, but you're in that range. We wouldn't have been alive 100 years ago at this age. There's no way. So the, the amount of wealth, the well-being, the health and longevity of, of many humans, especially in the West, is due in large part through the Industrial Revolution. However, it's got a really, really, really bad downside. And that's this global warming problem. I think a, 
again, saying it a little bit differently, I think there's so much money to be made by robustly doing what it takes to get off of fossil fuels and on a different energy source, that it's going to make the Industrial Revolution look like Charles points out. The Industrial Revolution was kind of a push thing, right? They went, oh, look at this. You know, let, let, we, you know we, can, we can use gasoline, and, you know, oil and, and coal, right, to power. A gallon of gasoline co- co- contains 400 hours of labor, of human labor, right? And a gallon of gas, that's a big deal. But it was a push. It was, it was a technological breakthrough and people saw the possibilities. This is a pull. We have to do this if we are going to survive as a species. So let me ask if you know, what percent of the population lives within 10 feet of sea level right now? Oh, I, I can't remember. I can't remember any of these numbers, but it's a well, big number. Be an interesting thing to know. My worry was that Russia benefits from global sea level rise and global warming. I, I know this is a little political, but it seems to me that they're like a kleptocracy. They're basically a criminal state and they would benefit if um, they basically were sitting on high ground and, you know, Tokyo and New York City and Washington, D.C. and London were all, you know, worried about 10 feet of sea level rise. Absolutely. Um, no, no question. No question about it. No question about it. And there, there are other there are probably other winners. I don't know about Australia. You know, Australia tectonically, at least the uh, east coast of Australia, is much like our coast. They have a lot of high, you know, high cliffs. Although the heating, the heating is a problem. Um, northern latitudes, Greenland. Uh, you know, the 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 past president, President Trump. You know, uh, floated the idea of buying Greenland. That is not a bad idea. <laughs> what would you do if you own Greenland? If if we own Greenland, well, I mean, Greenland's. You know, it's. Oh, it's not, it's not called Whiteland, right? At one point it was green, right? It has a lot of growth potential. And not only that, uh, a, a lot of, uh, of these, uh, Scandinavia is still rising from the last deglaciation. Alaska, for example, is still rising, right? Sea level's not going up in Alaska, it's going down because the land is rising still from the unweighting of ice over the last 20,000 years. Greenland is gonna rise, right? Sea level is not gonna flood Greenland. What would you do if you had Greenland? Months. What would I? What would I do? Well, I. What could you do is how, how could you change global warming if you owned Greenland? Oh, I, I'm not talking about that. I'm not. I'm not talking about doing anything about changing Greenland. Uh, again, my personal view is that Greenland will will almost certainly all melt, um, but it'll be a lot warmer and and be a place where either a large part of it or maybe all of it will be productive. It won't be covered in ice. Yeah, but the frightening thing is it's going to. Cause huge human displacement, right? Of course, of course. But, but it, it, Greenland itself will rise as the ice, as from the unweighting of the mile thick ice sheet. Got it. Again, I, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a specialist in Greenland. I'm talking, you know, I'm, I'm talking speculatively. If all of Greenland melts, one of the things that struck me, um, I gave a talk to uh, the Marine Recreation Association, which is how I got introduced to you. And I looked at, you know, books, uh, manuals that guidelines for marine birthing facilities, guidelines for safe operation for marinas, uh, design of small craft birthing facilities by the Department of Defense. I didn't see anything about climate, sea level, adaptation or retreat. None of those words were mentioned in any of these reports. So this seems to be opaque to the, to the boaters. Well, you know, the funny thing is, uh, it might seem that way if you look at the government publications, but those of us who are sailing on the bay are thinking about it all the time. And those who drive on 101 through Sausalito at the entrance to Mill Valley actually realize that uh, the road is sometimes blocked because of high water. The access. Yeah. So we're, many of us are paying attention. And your earlier slide with the gangway shows just that very same point. Reinhard Flick, it's been a great pleasure listening to such an informed presentation on a subject that must be important to all mariners. I want to thank you very much for sharing your knowledge, your wisdom, and your insights with the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thanks for having me. Great pleasure.